Thank you very much. I am very pleased and honored to speak to you. I am always very happy to come to Ireland, a country where Kevin was telling me in the preamble of the Constitution explains that this is a covenant between God and Ireland. No? So uh, let's uh, fight and work for that this covenant be uh, kept uh, and you will be faithful to it. So far, I mean, with the uh, homosexual marriage referendum and now the discussion on abortion, you risk uh, to lose the covenant because of these laws. And part of this is the result of the spreading of Russia's error, as we will see. Two weeks ago was the centenary of the Soviet Revolution, and just a little more than a month was the century of the last apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, where the miracle of the sun took place. So are these two things linked? Yes, definitely, because in the July 13th apparition, Our Lady said, if my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world. It's important to note that Our Lady says that it's not Russia itself that will be the whip to punish the world like Attila was in his time, but the errors of Russia, the importance of these ideological battles. No? And uh, being here in a library, no, Ideas had to be put in books, and books had to be preserved. So the importance of libraries in order to spread the Catholic faith and apologetics of that. So we are in the right place to, to talk about this. Mm? The, um, well, obviously, the errors of Russia, uh, that Our Lady speak of, are is communism. Mm? I'm sorry, I will just put this to work. Not to speak too much, because I'm Latin American, you know, and Fidel Castro used to uh, have eight hours speeches. No? <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to beat his record. Huh? Uh, so obviously, the, the, the errors of Russia are communist, and um, most people think that communist doctrine is an economic and uh, social political uh, agenda program that seeks equality by taking the money from the rich and distributing to the poor. No? But um, this, uh, if you ask someone in the street, what are the philosophical grounds for this redistribution of wealth, so to speak, very few will say, well, it is Marxism and in which Marxism consists. No? Um, in fact, communism is a real sect is an anti-church. That is the reality of communism. No? Its social political program is only a consequence, albeit important, of something much more serious, the communist philosophy, which aims to engender a new man. That is reality. No? And a kind of a reverse re uh, redemption of man. No? Uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels systematized that philosophy and it was made operative by Lenin, so that's why we speak about Marxist Leninism. No? Um, and this really was the great uh, uh, export product of uh, Soviet Russia throughout the 20th century. No? Now, which are the fundamental principles of Marxism? No? They are four. Materialism, evolutionary dialectics, relativism, and pragmatism. I will quickly describe them, and you will notice how much they just but they have penetrated in our daily lives. No? These principles already, how our society is soaked with these Marxist principles. So let's first see atheistic materialism. For Marxists, there is only matter. Mm? For Engels, the spirit is the supreme product of matter. Mm? And according to Marx, it is not possible to separate thought from thinking matter. So thought is just a, a kind of chemical 
uh, reaction in our brain. Mm? Uh, they deny the existence of spiritual beings such as God, the angels, or the human soul. Religion is nothing but the opiate of the people, so they will accept its oppression while waiting for heaven in another life, so they say. Well, so this crass and uh, atheistic materialist has led to the greatest religious persecution in history. We'll see that later. But it has two important consequences. On the one hand, that the material life of society has primacy over culture, politics, the law, etc. And, and there we see really this influence of materialists today, you know, where when people think in voting, for instance, they, what is their first concern? You know, salary, uh, economic growth, etc. People are really involved in a very economicist society today. Culture is something uh, secondary, you know, and religion even less. That is the first consequence of this materialist. On the other hand, the man is not free for them, no, because his thinking and action are set by the economic infrastructure where he lives. No? So Marx says it is not man's consciousness that determines his existence, but on the contrary, his social existence determines his con con conscience. So we are basically predetermined by economic uh, circumstances. No? We are not really free. No? So for them, man is a mere cog in a huge wheel, like a vile slave deprived of subjective responsibility. No? But the uh, effect of circumstances. No? Well, the second is evolutionist dialectics as a process of development of the world and history. So, it's an adaptation of Hegel's ideas. No? Matter is subject to perennial changes and in an ascending movement which takes qualitative leaps, like Darwin's idea. Because all beings, why uh, uh, things evolve? Because things carry internal contradictions within themselves and a superior synthesis is born from the struggle between these two opposing sides, one playing the role of positive thesis, the other the antithesis, and then a synthesis coming from it. Therefore, the world was not created by God, and it is self-managed by this dialectical evolution. You know? And what you find at the core of reality is not a being with capital B, no, identical with himself and immutable. No, the God who appears to Moses and said, I am who he is. So something permanent. And he created also the, his creation with a nature which is unchangeable. Our human nature is unchangeable. Men can change, but no human nature will remain. For them, no, nothing is permanent. Everything is permanently evolving. Mm? So what we find is a contradiction. Everything is and is not at the same time. Because things contain opposing elements whose struggle produces a new synthesis which is also unstable, fleeting and relative. No? So this struggle between opposites is the only permanent reality. So, class struggle, struggle between the sexes, you see today a, 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 a tremendous drive on that because of feminism, a struggle between generations, you know, young people against old people, poor countries against rich countries, and etc. You know? Everything is a struggle. And this entails a permanent and virulent attack on social order and peace, as well as on tradition, because progress is only conceivable as a denial of the present and the past. So you see, the consequences of this evolutionist materialist are very, very serious. Now, the third consequence, the third Marxist principle is an ontological and moral relativism. No? 
Because if the only absolute that exists is the struggle between opposites, reality is necessarily relative. It changes all the time. And also, the knowledge we have of reality changes because it has to evolve with reality itself. No? And so our knowledge is necessarily situated. No? Uh, and situated in a given place and a given moment. No? There are no universals or absolute and transcendent truth, but only partial and temporary notions immanent to reality itself, and a mere transient reflection of a moment of its evolution. No? That is the idea they have of any doctrine, of any idea. So, this ontological relativism leads to complete moral relativism. There are no universal norms or imperative precepts, because the only reality is matter, no? and this matter is always evolving. There are no objective and transcendent values, like good and evil, but only material advantages. The only driving force of human conduct is being self-interest, basically. So, the communists, I quote, the communists do not preach any morality, unquote. Marx says in the German ideology, and in his book, The Holy Family, he adds that <clears throat> well understood self-interest is the principle of all morality. Well, now we are really in the middle of that, in a society where everybody thinks that and reacts uh, according to their own interest. No? Moreover, as consciousness is determined by social existence, an economic uh, situation, its values are produced by and related to history. The culture of the time, the type of society, the, class, the social class you belong to, etc. So the morality of individuals can only be situation morals, you know, de depending on the place of society you are and uh, in the circumstances you live. For a Marxist, there is only one categorical imperative, a moral duty, to advance the revolution. By what? Exacerbating all form of class struggles. You know, between poor and rich, between young and old, between uh, the one region against the, the central government, etc. And since, since this end of advancing the revolution justifies all means by employing fraud and violence without hesitation if they are effective, no? so they are terrorists, etc. Communist morality, Lenin wrote, is based on the struggle for the strengthening and perfecting of communism. You see, that is the only moral law that exists to advance communism. No? So, from these three, materialism, evolution, and relativism, comes a fourth. It is praxis as the ultimate criterion of truth. No? There is not a, a, a transcendent truth, but only a practical truth. If everything is matter, and matter is in perpetual evolution, any intellectual exercise that seeks to extract a theoretical truth from reality, such as metaphysics does, here we are probably, I don't know, philosophy must be in that <laughs> shelf, no? It's metaphysics on, on this side, metaphysics, all that is metaphysics. That is rubbish, no? Uh, because it's doomed to failure, no? However, man is capable of understanding, uh, undertaking a revolutionary transformation of the world. Therefore, the only intellectual speculation that makes sense is to develop a philosophy of praxis. As Mao Zedong said, theory depends on practice. Theory is grounded on practice and is in turn at the service of practice. Well, all our politicians have a lot of this uh, thinking, no? And unfortunately, even some of our clergymen now are, in the name of pastoral um, effectiveness, they are taking a very similar approach. And 
goes, uh, Marx goes on to say that the question of knowing whether there is any objective truth in human thought is not a matter, a matter of theory, but practice. It is in praxis that the human being has to prove the truth. The only thing that counts, therefore, is the result. And any argument or theory is valid only insofar as it serves to justify the revolutionary transformation of the world. Well, these four errors of Marxism were not limited to pure theory, but were put into practice soon after Lenin seized power, you know, in 1917, 100 years ago. As has been said, the Soviet Union organized the greatest religious persecution of Christians recorded in history. On December 4, 1917, all church properties were nationalized. Two months later, the teaching of religion in schools was outlawed and allowed only in private and for adults. So children not even in private couldn't be, uh, could, could be taught. No? Uh, so the parents were put into jail if they taught catechism to their children. No? In 1929, the teaching of atheism in school was made compulsory. We are very close now of that in, in our countries. No? In, by 1930, four-fifths of village churches has already been closed or destroyed. And in the early 40s, more than 100 bishops of the Orthodox Church and tens of thousands of clerics, monks and lay people had been killed or died of exhaustion in the gulags. After the German invasion of Russia, some restrictions of religion were reduced and the Orthodox hierarchy sided with the Soviet government and in order to fight the German invasion and allowed to be infiltrated by the KGB. We know now that since the war, World War II, all the hierarchy of the Orthodox Church were basically all members of the KGB. In addition to the Soviet Union, the same communist religious hatred decimated hundreds of thousands of Catholics in Mexico, you know, the Cristero War, in Spain during the Civil War, 36 to 39, in Eastern Europe, in China, in Cuba, in Southeast Asia, I mean Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, etc., and in Africa. So the huge, the, I mean, the, this black book on communists counts more than 100 million victims. You know? have no, no regime has produced such amount of victims. So putting into practice the moral relativists or Marxists, as early of October 1920, the Russian Soviet Federative Republic was the main unit of the USSR, was the first public entity since pagan antiquity to authorize free abortion on demand with a decree on women's health. So abortion that is about to be imposed in this, you don't react here in Ireland, is a communist pro product. No? Was the first country in in, 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 in modern times, I mean, in the antiquity, it was allowed, but since Christianity prevailed, abortion was outlawed. R Russia was the very first country, no? in 1920 already. The next year, so in 1921, the same happened in the Soviet Republic of Ukraine and in the rest of the USSR. So the argument employed, <laughs> we all know it very well, was the that uncontrolled and dangerous clandestine abortions would otherwise continue, no? Black street abortion was exactly the same argument. By 1925, hospitals were crammed with women seeking to abort, and specialized clinics had to be set up, no? because they know they will occupy all the beds. No? Um, <clears throat> the subsequent decline in population was such that Stalin, shortly before World War II, 
has to recriminalize abortion. No? It's, in, it, it will, it's ha happening everywhere now. No? We are being depopulated de because of abortion. But his law, Stalin's law, recriminalizing abortion, was repealed after his death in 1953. And today, in Russia, there is abortion on demand and has one of the, uh, the highest rate of abortion in the world per, per capita. <clears throat> Well, sexual liberation didn't start in the 60s with the hippies, as people think, but it start with the Russian Revolution. In 1917-1918, Alexandra Kolontai was the first woman to hold the post in the revolutionary government of Soviet Russia as Commissar of Welfare. Already before the revolution, in a programmatic booklet titled sexual relations and class struggle, love and the new morality, Alexandra Kolontai criticized the oppressive nature of individual love, in which each partner owns the other and both are jealous, and yearned for greater flexibility and experimentation in sexual relations. In her novel, Three Generations, she recounts the conflicts between a grandmother, a daughter, and a granddaughter regarding the ongoing sexual revolution of the time. The granddaughter is a leader of the communist youth and a model of the new emancipated woman. She thinks that sex has nothing to do with love. Now, here we are full in our society. Eh? Eh, nothing to do with love. She lives with two men and become pregnant by one of them, not knowing who the father of her, of her child is. So, occasional sex, says Alexander Kolontai, quote, is as banal as having a glass of vodka to quench your thirst, no? unquote. This is sex. Well, our youth is taught no, in classrooms this, basically. The impact of these theories among young people shocked even Lenin, who openly disagreed with the glass of vodka theory. No? Said that this is bourgeois morality, etc. The working class is very austere. And said it was corrupting the socialist youth, despite agreeing that free love was the ideal to, one, to which one should tend. No? As a communist, he agreed, but he saw the social impact of this. Uh, glass of vodka theory. Mm. So you see, all this corruption we are uh, being flooded with and being taught in the schools comes from Russia. That was the very first country where it was implanted. No? In a pamphlet published 1923, entitled The Sexual Revolution in Russia, Grigory Batkis, who was the director of the Institute of Social Hygiene in Moscow, stated that, quote, Soviet legislation bases itself on the following principle. It declares the absolute non-interference of the state and society into sexual matters so long as nobody is injured and no one's interests are encroached upon concerning homosexuality, sodomy, and various other forms of sexual gratification which are set down in European legislation as offenses against morality. Soviet legislation treats this exactly as so-called natural intercourse. So also homosexuality, you know, the very first place where uh, homosexuality and so it was accepted was once again Soviet Russia. You know? And now you have homosexual marriage in your Christian country. So, in fact, free love was widely practiced in juvenile communes and, and they and was so deprived that uh, Stalin once again has to close them down. Well, one month after the November Revolution, two decrees were promulgated on married people or those seeking to marry. <coughs> one established civil marriage and the other divorce on demand by either spouse, which in effect turned marriage into a mere civil union. So once again, they are 80 years in advance of the Western countries, which 
uh, open civil unions only in the 80s, and two steps away from free law, because, because it was enough to declare one's change of residency to the authorities. I, I'm living with this person in this place, and well, I moved and now live with this other person in this other place. No? It was a purely administrative uh, report. Another libertarian measure was to end the minimum age of consent to have sex, replacing it with the fluid concept of sexual maturity, which remained in the Soviet Penal Code until 1999. So it was the judge, the, the judge who, in, actually in France, is the same now, and there is a court case, a, a huge scandal because um, a, a girl age Eight, uh, 11 was raped, but then the rapist was uh, dismissed you know, because it was consent you know, uh, uh, behavior. Well, one of the main groups favored by this lowering of the minimum age uh, were the homosexuals. You know? Prior to 1917, the, the, they have tried, the communists, to decriminalize the sodomy. You know? But with the October Revolution, they abrogated the penal code and a new one was imposed in 1922 in which the crime of voluntary sodomy was removed on the claim that homosexual inclination is either congenital or a result from a mental illness. So repression would not be beneficial in any case. No? So we have even today priests uh, saying, you no, know, this famous Father Martin in America, no, basically says the same. <clears throat> um, moreover, the courts recognized same-sex unions. In 1922, a transsexual soldier married a female employee of the post office of the city where his regiment, her regiment, really, was located. When she was found to be a woman, she was accused by the local court of committing a crime against nature, but the Minister of Justice declared the marriage legal, quote, because it was consummated by mutual consent, unquote. So you have already, in 1922, no, Russia, Soviet Russia, admitting transgender people no, and uh, homosexual marriages. <clears throat> Obviously, the errors of Marxists had many other applications, especially in the economic, and social, and political field. But I limit myself to this, the ones who had spread the most in the West, and we, we live in the middle of this. No? Now, the errors of Russia, how they spread in the West, in two ways. No? A direct and open through the communist parties throughout the world, and their allies and an indirect and underhanded one through what has been conventionally called the cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. So, Russia is entirely responsible for the open and direct diffusion of Marxists because of the leadership that Moscow assumed in the World Communist Revolution. Mm -hmm. In March 1919, in St. Petersburg, Lenin opened the third Communist International Congress, it's called Con Comintern, because it's a German abbreviation, no? which aimed, quote, at the creation of an international Soviet Republic, Republic as a transitional stage to the complete abolition of the state, unquote. From the fifth Congress, held in 25, after the rise of Stalin, the international, the Comintern, adopted new statutes which began the so-called Bolshevization or Russification of the Communist International and its member parties. In 1943, the Comintern was dissolved to allow, just to allow the fears of the capitalist countries in the world because they were allies you know, to fight against Nazis. You know. But in, this, in despite of the Comintern, it didn't exist anymore, all the communist parties in the world continue to turn to Moscow to, for guidance and uh, funding and everything. 
and so a source of inspiration and political and doctrinal leadership, giving the Kremlin a greater supremacy than the one the Vatican has in the Catholic Church. So it was really the uh, Russian Communist Party that led communists all over the world, and they infiltrated with these ideas the whole world. No? Now, the undirect and camouflage expansions of the eros of Russia came in three ways, acting in parallel. The first was developed by Antonio Gramsci, one of the founders of the Italian Communist Party and the Italian delegate to the Third Comintern Congress in 1922. He was condemned in 1928 by the fascist regime to 20 years imprisonment for incitement to civil war. And he began to write his famous prison notes or notebooks centered on the question of how to make Marxists penetrate in a country like Italy marked by a profound cultural and religious tradition. That was the, the main problem. We, we conquered Russia, but we had never been able to conquer you know, a, a Western country and uh, more civilized and very religious. You know. He asserts that changes in the relations of production are not what advanced the revolution, but must be preceded, advanced, by change in the values of civil society. In this cultural battle, the main enemies are not the bosses, but the four organizations that create what he calls common sense, that is, the people's way of thinking, which are these four institutions, the church, the family, the school, and the media. You know? So the two first, it's necessary to undermine them and criticize them and you know, uh, put them aside. You know? And the school and the media being infiltrated and controlled by themselves. You know? So an elite of organic intellectuals who are able to interpret the sentiment of the masses must try to carry out a cultural penetration and impregnate society with immanentist materialism by using the very language of bourgeois culture. So democracy, freedom, human rights, etc. And seeking allies in the ecclesiastical, artistic, academic, and journalistic world. These allies need not declare themselves Marxist, but rather just open to new ideas. They are progressivists you know, and favor the ideological transshipment of society towards Marxism. So the proof of the great success of the Gramscian strategy is that after the fall of the Berlin Wall and despite of the discrediting of the communist parties, Marxist ideas have never penetrated so deeply into modern society as we see around us, you know, effectively establishing what Cardinal Ratzinger at the time denounced as dictatorship of relativism. Mm? Well, the second vehicle to spread the errors of Russia was the so-called Frankfurt School. In 1922, Felix Weil, you see that him there in the, the picture, he was the son of a very wealthy German businessman and author of a doctoral thesis on <coughs> practical problems for the implementation of socialism, organized the first week of Marxist studies, which included among its participants Georg Lukács, former education commissar of an ephemeral communist government in Hungary and the first world promoter of a pornographic sex education program. Now, in, in this, in really, the, the text of, for, of, of his uh, uh, educa sex education program was really pornographic. He, he wanted even have children practicing church, uh, sex in order to learn. The, the meeting resulted in the founding of the Institute for Social Research, for which Weil obtained from the government the status of a university institution. Important personalities within the institute were Marx Horkheimer, Erich Fromm, Theodor Adorno, Wilhelm Reich, and Herbert Marcuse. All of them attempted to fill the gaps between uh, classical Marxism or not, and the rest of the sciences with input from various disciplines and particularly Freudian 
psychoanalysis. When Hitler assumed power in 1933, they migrated to the United States and began teaching at major universities, especially in Colombia. After the war, some returned to Frankfurt, where a new social research institute resumed activities until Theodor Adorno died in 1969. But the rest of the team, which included Herbert Marcuse, stayed in the United States. No? The thinking of the Frankfurt School is summarized in the so-called critical theory, which questions the rationalist and authoritarianism of the bourgeois society which supposedly operates as a cultural conditioning to prevent its victims from experiencing alienation. So uh, the, the child in the family no, uh, doesn't experience the alienation of the authoritarian family because he's conditioned by the family model. No? So this subjection, or the same in the school, etc. So the engine to break free from this alienation should be man's subjectivity an instinct, that is the Freudian part of this new Marxism. Mm? Eros and the craving for to be happy in freedom. Mm? And the agent of this total revolution should not be the working class, but rather the marginalized social sectors. So, sexual minorities, feminists and homosexuals, migrants, um, ethnic and indigenous minorities, etc who must employ new forms of organization and protest, the so-called social movements, you know, and their occupation, Occupy Wall Street, uh, Indignados in Spain, the Black Bloc, you know, that uh, disturb all kind of... In Marcuse's words, quote, the ideas and traditional strategy of revolution are outdated. We need to carry out a kind of diffuse and disperse disintegration of the system, unquote. And in reality, they, they succeeded because they destroyed the family, they destroyed the school, <coughs> they destroyed even the churches, no? Everything was destroyed from within. Mm? So, from these postulates was born the counterculture of the 1960s aimed at, quote, discovering new models of family, new sexual, sexual customs, new lifestyles, new aesthetics forms, and new identities." Unquote. In these environments, the new non-authoritarian society would be formed. <coughs> and so we are fully on, on, on that. No? And this is pure Marxism. No? The, 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 this, all these philosophers belong to the Frankfurt School and are officially Marxists. So, uh, the, the worst was that this really uh, scattering society and disintegrated everything. No? Now, the third undirect way is represented by a handful of French scholars, heralds of what they call post-modernity, no? notably Deleuze, Foucault, and Derrida, who became famous in the United States, giving rise to the so-called French theory, and in Europe as theory of deconstruction. All Marxists, they undertook the deconstruction of Western metaphysics and its quest for an objective notion of reality. According to them, in a world made of relationships that change in incessantly, our intellect manages to grasp only a fluid, polymorphic and subjective meaning of things. As Deleuze says, there are no such things as universal. There is only, there is nothing transcendent, no unity, no subject or object, no reason. No. There are only processes. We believe in processes. No. Well, this appears very fluid, no? but it is not the case to analyze here the outlandish elucubration of these authors. Very incomprehensible, actually. But we should note that they were the main inspirers of Judith Butler, particularly Foucault. No? She is a disciple of Foucault. No? So this, she is, as you know, the leading star of no, uh, gender theory and uh, the most radical version of gender theory, which is queer theory. No? Um, 
that postulates the indeterminacy and instability of all individual identities. We don't have a personal identity. No? We evolve all the time. No? This claim that persons are always in process, building themselves at every instant through expression. So, by talking to you, I am building myself. No? So I am different after the talk than at the beginning. So, it's not the talk that is influenced by my personality, but the opposite. It's my personality that is formed, shaped by my talk. So, we live in a parody. No? She, she uses the expression. Our lives are parodies. But this parody transforms us. No? And that's why you can, do, you can, do, you can be anything. No? Uh, it, and that is really the, 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 the core of this gender theory. But most uh, grave is the, um, I mean, the, the, the most radical opposition of the idea of a personal God that is immutable. No? Nothing is uh, personal. No? But, and these are the things that are being taught in the schools to children of uh, the age of 8, 9, 10. No? It, it's just incredible. No? Now, so far this is very bad. The eros of Russia is spreading no, throughout the world. Now comes the saddest part of it. No? How these errors spread within the Catholic Church. Huh? One would say, well, that's impossible. But unfortunately, it uh, happened. No? So, the infiltration of materialistic atheism in the Catholic Church has followed closely that of liberal Protestantism, where figures like Thomas Altizer openly developed in the 60s the theology of the death of God. This theology of the death of God claims that the transcendent God became incarnate as Christ and died once and for all to this transcendency with the death of Christ to become universally immanent in man and cosmos until the complete identification of everything so that God eventually will be all in all. No? So if there was one personal God, no? he disappeared and became a divine energy in the cosmos. No? A kind of new age no? a concept of God. The incarnate world now is not a resurrected Jesus, but has become universally and immanently one with all cosmic and human energy and life, moving forward to a final totality. No? That is uh, Thomas Altizer's idea. This, he is a, a, a liberal Protestant. No? But if we look closely, we see that Telar de Chardin's cosmology, you know, the Jesuit, no? uh, now in these days is circulating a kind of uh, letter, open letter to the Pope, asking him to take the um, restrictions no, for the spreadings of uh, Telar de Chantal's books in seminaries and Catholic uh, institutions. No? Well, uh, so, according to the most, the world famous Jesuit, matter has become through time increasingly complex in its organization, what has resulted in a corresponding rise in the level of consciousness. The three steps of this evolution has been, so far, the geosphere, matter, the biosphere, life, and the biosphere, rather, in English, and the noosphere, consciousness, so men. The incarnation of the world initiated, so Jesus Christ, the further process of Christogenesis, as you see there, here, no? Christogenesis wherein the whole universe tends towards point omega. That is to say, the final union with Christ and the creation of a new heaven and a new earth, as St. Paul says, where there is no essential difference between the creature and creator. And that is the problem, no? Because it's pantheistic at the end. What both views, Altizer's views and 
Telar de Chantal's views has in common is the disappearance of God's transcendency. In Altaïs's view, God becomes immanent and profane. In Telar's views, it is the cosmos that divinizes and sacralizes itself, integrating God. But the end result is the same, a radical anthropocentrism and a monism. I mean, the whole uh, of the universe is one single being, in which the divinity identifies itself with the cosmos. Mm? Well, immanentism is thus the modern name of atheism, because, as for, for, uh, Father Cornelio Fabro wrote in the last chapter of his God in Exile, quote, the principle of immanentism is intrinsically atheistic, and coincides with the radical assertions of atheists." Unquote. Why? Because immanentism is the error of understanding quote, the immanence of God or of his action in us in such a way that it could, in fact, exclude the reality of his transcendency. Unquote. So immanence is God dwelling in us, real immanence. God is immanent in, in, in the universe, that's for sure. But real one is the dwelling in us through divine grace, but for immanentists, by denying the transcendency of God, utterly falsifies the divine nature, identifying it with the whole cosmos. We, in heaven, we will see God face to face. No? So that means there are two faces. No? Uh, like Americans say, that you need two to tango. No? So uh, uh, we will not disappear and God will not disappear. But in this conception, we all are reunited in one a divine being. Mm? Mm. So, the transcendency of God is no longer that of classical metaphysics, but it is understood in an existential and historical sense. God is the horizon that precedes us and makes us know all the rest. Transcendency is experience in existence, whereby God communicates himself in existence. God reveals himself in the world to everybody and as man in all, is, is always situated in a particular history, God reveals himself in history, not outside but inside history. Profane and sacred history coincide and the voice of God can be heard by listening to historical events that occur in the humanity of my time because that is where God speaks to me and to everyone. Revelation takes place in the encounter between conscience and history, and no one is excluded from it. Therefore, even pagans and atheists are anonymous Christians. No? So, uh, someone will imagine that I am inventing this, no, this Karl Runner's uh, theology. No? That is just a resume or what Karl Rahner's uh, think. No? The church itself is part of the world. No? Uh, is world to all intents and purposes and must read the signs of the world, dissolving itself at its service. The church must dissolve itself at the service of the world. The church's mission is human promotion and philanthropy, not evangelization. No? Today is... Uh, when they go to Africa, it's just for purpose of human development, not to evangelize. Mm? These absurdities, no, as I say, are not an invention of mine. It's a resume of Karl Rahner's theology. He was the most influential theologian at the Second Vatican Council and one of the main writers of his dogmatic constitution, Lumen Gentium, which was very much marked by this uh, theology. Shortly after Vatican II, the students of the Lateran University, you know the Lateran University is the university that belongs to the Pope, no? were asked who is the main Catholic theologian of all times. No? Well, everybody was expecting, well, they would say Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine. No, they put Karl Rahner. No? Well, it's enough to, 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 to say that uh, uh, Cardinal Walter Kasper is the disciple of Karl Rahner. No? Uh, so that you have the idea, the influence he had. No? So, we notice the strong influence of Runner's immanentism in modern Catholic theology and in Paris life 
in the exorbitant use of the sign of the times, no? vocable, and in interpreting and applying divine revelation, as if God himself were evolving together with the world, in the exorbitant appeal to modern conscience and sciences to justify changes in morals. For instance, Father Martin in America, he says, well, with Freud we understand better sexuality and we cannot consider homosexuality as unnatural. No? Uh, in the total loss of sacrality in liturgy, no? so it's the assembly that celebrates itself and, and play guitar and no? all this, um, and the inclusion of totally profane elements in the sacred rites, in the new fashion of calling God in an informal way, you instead of thee, no? uh, because that is you know, too transcendent the God, and he is a, com a comrade, you know? a comrade God in the excessive involvement of the church in purely humanitarian work and worldly struggles. No? Now, for instance, ecology now, no? uh, or immigration. I will be speaking in, uh, in Limerick about the church and immigration, for instance. No? And also the parallel abandonment of purely religious activities, like catechesis, uh, um, pilgrimages, etc. No? So, Immanentis necessarily leads to the acceptance of evolutionary dialectics to explain the march of the cosmos towards the large omega point or runner's hypostatic union between God and nature. To reconcile theology with evolution rather develop the concept of self-transcendency, the idea that the being can grow beyond itself, no? which is totally r r ridiculous. No? Well, and, but the goes to the spirit, no, the, 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 the Holy Spirit, in its turn is pointing towards an ultimate deeper union between the spirit and matter, and ultimately to the union of matter and spirit with their creator. So you have here again the idea of, of uh, immanence. No? So uh, if God uh, evolves, Man evolves, human understanding evolves, so the dogma evolves. No? Things must change. No? Every formula of the faith no, can be uh, surpassed according to him. No? So this leads to relativist immorals, obviously, no? uh, and the situational ethics that was condemned by Pius XII, no? and Unfortunately, the um, worst example of this uh, new situational ethics is uh, uh, paragraph 303 of the Pope Francis uh, Apostolic Exhortation Amoris Laetitia that says an, an adulterous person can uh, think and recognize with sincerity and honesty that Remaining in his adulterous relationship is the best he can do because uh, otherwise will be very bad. And this is what God is asking from him. No? And Joseph Seifert, a very famous philosopher, very good friend of uh, Pope John Paul II and um, Pope Benedict XVI, wrote an article, asked the Pope to withdraw this paragraph, say, because if you apply that, no, also for abortion, for euthanasia, etc., everybody will say, well, I feel in a situation where what, what God is uh, demanding from me is this. Actually, the bishops of the eastern coast of Canada already applied that for euthanasia, no? uh, allowing priests to give the last sacraments to people who had requested to be uh, killed. No? It is awful. No? So, and then... Uh, o uh, instead of obviously of uh, uh, very theoretical, uh, yours is this one. Uh, uh, the, the theoretical uh, doctrine, uh, pra uh, praxis. No, you have this. <laughs> no, this is today. Today, churches uh, is very well reflected in in in, in, in that uh, cartoon. No, uh, in one side we offer. Com comforting lies instead of unpleasant truths, no? uh, and faith is just an experience. No, uh, it's not uh, 
I mean, a, a revealed truth that we received no? uh, from the apostles and the fathers of the church, etc., etc., through the ages, and coming to our ears, but it's just a personal experience no? uh, with God, with a form of immanentism. Mm? And, well, another practical infiltration of Marxist theory in the church was liberation theology. It's so obvious that I don't need to, uh, to, to, to speculate on that. No? And uh, unfortunately, we uh, confirmed that. Just one word. Today, people think that, uh, and, uh, and Russian propaganda puts that the real bulwark against Marxism is Russia today. No? <laughs> that Marxism was infiltrated by the West into Russia to weaken Russia, but Russia was freed from Marxism, and we are now the ones who have Marxism in ourselves. So we need to turn to Russia in order to um, fight against Marxism. No? And, uh, but it's true that the Western countries served as platform for Renaissance, Italy, uh, Reformation, Germany and England, the French Revolution, uh, France, but they, they didn't embrace communists, while Russia re did embrace communists. No? And not only that, in general, the leaders who put the Third Revolution into practice consented that all her energies be used for the international diffusion of, of communists and has not yet made a Nuremberg Tribunal no? in order to clear up the past. No? So, uh, it's, uh, it's not clear that Russia will be the bulwark of Christianity. No? Plus, we uh, know that Putin himself says that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest drama of the 20th century. No? He is very supportive of all the left-wing uh, governments in Latin America, no? uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, uh, Ecuador, etc. Precisely the countries where these governments are putting into practice homosexual marriage, abortion, etc. No? So how Christian is him? He is a, national Rus in, in a Russian nationalist, and because these countries are against the United States, no, he fights for them. No? Because basically for him, the, 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 the main principle is Russian interests. No? And also, we cannot imagine that a country where, for instance, surrogacy is uh, legal, no? this is a propaganda for Westerners, homosexual Westerners, because you have is a, is a man there, no? to uh, have uh, rent uh, wombs in Russia. No? Abortion is on demand. This is a clinic. No? This is the right for the, the, the various... No? Uh, uh, how advanced is the pregnancy? More expensive, no? And has the highest rate of, of abortion in the world, or per capita, no? Uh, divorce, no, has also one of the I mean, one of the highest levels of marriage already, and plus one of the highest levels of divorce. Mm -hmm. And alcoholism, that for sure is the largest in the world. So. Unfortunately, the Russian population is very much corrupted. No? And um, Professor Roberto De Mattei, the Italian historian, told me that once in St. Petersburg he met a, a, a member of the patriarchy, the Russian patriarchy. This was at the time where in France there was the La Manif pour tous, one million people on the street. And this uh, member of the Orthodox Church told him, you dream of our leaders. But we dream of your people, no? because in Russia we don't have that. No? That is the reality of Russia. Also, they say a lot that there is a religious revival. In reality, it's not that much. It's only 60% of Russian, 60% uh, of those who declare themselves Orthodox go to Mass. No? And it's mainly the old people. No? When you see, for instance, in, in Poland, is 45 or 46 percent, no? and so it is. It is not true that Russia will be the bulwark of Christianity. Mm? And but our lady promised that if the Pope 
no? Uh, consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart, it, uh, Russia will be converted. So we must pray for the conversion of Russia, no? and that is Our Lady of Fatima pray for our country, but in Russian. No? <laughs> and thank you very much, also in Russian. <laughs>